This is New York Central and Hudson River Railroad number 999. The locomotive is famously known for being the first steam engine in the world to reach over 100 miles per hour in 1893. Well, at least that's how the story goes. Some railroad historians believe that the locomotive never reached that speed. So without further ado, let's dive into 999's history and the days that it allegedly broke the speed record. Leading up to the 1893 Chicago World's Columbian Exposition, most of the United States major railways were in fierce competition with one another. They were looking to reduce their passenger train's travel times to the city by increasing speeds. By far the most notorious rivalry was between the New York Central and Hudson River Railroad and the Pennsylvania Railroad. The Pensy had the edge on New York Central and was outperforming them. Railroad executives of the New York Central needed to respond quickly. George Henry Daniels, general passenger agent for the Central, was tasked with putting together a plan. Daniels was a creative genius when it came to advertising and creating slogans. He was known in advertising circles as the Prophet and was a jack of all trades. He had experience in writing, editing, being a travel agent, promoter, and negotiator. The Central valued his expertise so much that they put him in charge of their new advertising department, which was created specifically for him in 1906. Now, at the same time Daniels was given the task, the public and the press were obsessed with speed. Railroads on the East Coast would run advertisements in newspapers, claiming they had the fastest trains in the United States. Some even went as far as saying the world, whether or not that's true. Well, in 1891, New York Central was looking to establish a fast and luxurious regular passenger train between Grand Central Depot and Buffalo, New York. The Central had asked Daniels to come up with a name for the service. He thus coined it as the Empire State Express. Conveniently, its slogan was the fastest regular train in the world. And of course, that was promoted heavily in newspapers and advertisements leading up to and after its first regular run on October 26, 1891. But it didn't stop at just advertising. The railroad wanted a new locomotive capable of reaching high speeds. H. Walter Webb, vice president of the Central, gave the task to locomotive superintendent and designer William Buchanan. He had been with the railroad since 1851 and had been trying to perfect his I-Class 440 locomotives. 440 meaning four leading wheels, four driving wheels, and zero trailing. 440s were nicknamed the American type. Having been first introduced in the United States in the late 1830s, they made up 85% of all steam locomotives in the country by 1870. Up to this point, the technology had been nearly pushed to its mechanical limits. Buchanan 440s were known for their uniform pattern high capacity boilers, large diameter driving wheels, and standard sized cylinders. All in all, 79 were built between 1890 and 1899. In order for his 440s to achieve higher speeds, Buchanan had to make a couple of changes. His latest build 440 by the Schenectady T Locomotive Works was used as his initial test subject in 1891. As built, number 870 had 69 inch in diameter driving wheels. Buchanan replaced them with massive 78 inch ones and increased the locomotive's boiler pressure from 160 to 170 pounds. With larger driving wheels, they can travel faster while making less revolutions per spin than smaller wheels. This in turn reduces friction and wear on the locomotive and its bearings. When it came time to test locomotive number 870, a run was made from New York to East Buffalo on September 14, 1891. It covered 436.5 miles in nearly 7 hours and 33 minutes averaging a speed of 61.5 miles per hour and a top speed of 82 miles per hour. Up to this point, the fastest recorded train was the Royal Blue Line, run in conjunction by the Baltimore and Ohio and Reading and Jersey Central Railroads. It covered 200 miles between Jersey City and Washington, D.C. at an average speed of 52.8 miles per hour. Buchanan was pleased with these results and tested even larger 86 in diameter driving wheels on 440 number 903 in 1892. At the same time, George Daniels was also pleased. The new Empire State Express and Buchanan's locomotive tests generated massive publicity. The rivalry between Pennsylvania Railroad and New York Central was at an all-time high when these events took place. Daniels now wanted to blow Pensy out of the water. Just how did he intend to do this? 
The upcoming 1893 World's Columbian Exposition at Jackson Park in Chicago. It was a six-month event to show off past and present country's achievements in areas such as art, culture, and, most important to him, technology. Millions of people were to attend the event, and it was the perfect place for mass publicity. Pensy's exhibit was to showcase the evolution of their equipment. Their main showpiece to be featured was the popular John Bull steam locomotive. Having been built in 1831, it is one of the oldest surviving steam engines in the United States. Pensy had previously restored the John Bull in 1876 and had been using it for publicity ever since. New York Central essentially did the same as Pensy was doing, except they didn't have a locomotive nearly as old as a John Bull to display. So, New York Central built a working replica of the 1831-built Dewitt Clinton steam locomotive, originally owned by one of their predecessors. Quick side note, this locomotive is currently displayed at the Henry Ford Museum in Dearborn, Michigan. For New York Central's exhibit, Daniels wanted to showcase the Dewitt Clinton alongside a new locomotive to help further promote the Empire State Express. But he didn't just want any ordinary new locomotive, but a publicity engine, as he called it one that could reach 100 miles per hour. The result was William Buchanan designing locomotive number 999. It was built in-house at New York Central's West Albany shops in April 1893. The slightly enlarged I-Class 440 was completed at a cost of $13,000 and had the following specs. Huge 86-inch driving wheels, 19-inch by 24-inch cylinders, weight 124,000 pounds. Its boiler jacketing was painted in beautiful Russia iron and accented by brass trim. Prominently written on its tender in silver script were the words Empire State Express. Shortly after rolling out of the Albany shops, 999 and the Dewitt Clinton were put on display at Grand Central Depot on April 21, 1893. 999 was scheduled to pull the Dewitt Clinton and his train set by flat car to the World's Fair on its opening date, May 1st. But before their journey to Chicago, 999 made several runs to demonstrate its power and speed. The first occurred on April 24th. Four days later on April 28th, 999 took the Empire State Express from New York to Albany. While it was between Poughkeepsie and Albany, timers calculated 999 had reached a speed of 86.5 miles per hour and covered the entire 70-mile run in 72 minutes. When 999 took the Dewitt Clinton to Chicago, thousands showed up to catch a glimpse at both locomotives. However, 999 wasn't attending the fair just yet. Daniels wanted it to break the speed record first. After dropping off the Dewitt Clinton, 999 was sent back to the West Albany shops in preparation for its speed record runs. H. Walter Webb selected engineer Charles Charlie Hogan and his regular fireman Albert Elliott as a crew for the run. A native from Cleveland, Hogan was a senior engineer at the Central known for piloting cracked trains. As a matter of fact, he was the engineer on New York Central's number 870 in 1891 when it broke the speed record. He also reportedly got number 903 up to 93 miles per hour a few days before 999's scheduled runs. With his expertise, he was a logical choice. On May 9, 1893, 999 was put on the Empire State Express for his first attempt at achieving over 100 miles per hour. Charlie reportedly got 999 up to 102.8 miles per hour for one mile near Forks, New York, though he believed she could do better. The next day, May 10th, 999 was one mile west of Batavia, New York when Charlie opened his throttle wide open. It was reported to have covered this mile in 32 seconds, equivalent to a speed of 112.5 miles per hour. It was also on the same day 24 years prior that the last spike, a golden one, for the Transcontinental Railroad was driven in in Promontory, Utah. This was no coincidence. George Daniels further used this as a means for more publicity. Now here's why historians today, and even professionals in the railroading industry back then, doubt 999 reached those speeds. First off, steam locomotives in the United States during the 19th century had no speedometers. If you've noticed, all those speed recordings I mentioned were calculated by timers riding the train using stopwatches between mileposts. Using stopwatches to record train speeds isn't necessarily unreliable. 
Former Smithsonian curator Bill Withun says this method was fairly accurate up until about 70 miles per hour. Mile markers after that speed appears a hectic blur. It's very likely some mile markers were missed as timers' attention rotated between them and their watches. To further support his argument, I found a contemporary account from a reporter describing the conditions on the May 9th run. Quote, Stations spun by, fences which enclose the spring touch fields looked like longboard lines, and trackmen who were working on different sections of the Central's Big Four tracked roadbed looked like phantom figures. Apparently, some of the people who joined in on timing with reporters and railroad executives were paying passengers. Who knows if they were using regular pocket watches instead of calibrated stopwatches. Even an author of the Locomotive Engineering Journal said in the June 1893 edition, These claims of terrific speed are not official and we do not believe that the engine ran 100 miles an hour, but it has probably made the highest speed of any locomotive in the world. The other issue railroad professionals have is the mechanical limits of 999. Using 999 specs, its cylinder horsepower rating can be calculated using standards developed by engineer Francis J. Cole of the American Locomotive Company. Its speed would be in the high 80s, possibly early 90s, with 100 miles per hour being the near limit of its capacity. However, sometimes locomotives exceeded that calculated rating when they were tested in the real world. Immediately after the May 10th run, New York newspapers published sensational headlines proclaiming 999 had traveled faster than any vehicle on land. Both the locomotive and Charlie Hogan were immortalized as celebrities. Hogan was promoted to traveling engineer for the New York Central, training new engineers, and later on became division superintendent of motor power. He was very humble. He rarely talked about the runs he made on 999 and cited him meeting Abraham Lincoln as a boy was one of the proudest moments of his life. 999's fame eventually led to vast merchandise. Companies started selling toys and model trains with the number 999. One company even produced miniature live steam locomotives used at amusement parks that were modeled after the appearance of it. George Daniels also managed to have a commemorative two-cent stamp made depicting the Empire State Express in 1901. However, probably one of the most interesting pieces that stem from its fame is practically right in my backyard. In 1932, New York Central employees who belonged to the American Legion's Collinwood, Ohio, post number 999, built a working replica of 999. This street-legal vehicle has run in many parades all over the United States. It was constructed on a 1930 Hudson truck frame and is currently owned by the Painesville Railroad Museum. Immediately after 999's record-breaking runs, it was rushed off to the World's Fair for exhibition with five brand new Wagner Palace Car Company cars. The theme for the fair was Christopher Columbus's journey to the Americas, and thus these palatial cars were fittingly named the Columbus, Isabella, Fernadan, Pinzon, and San Salvador. Of all the 31 other full-size steam locomotives on display at the fair, 999 was the attendee's favorite. When the fair concluded on October 30th, 1893, 999 pulled the Wagner Palace cars and the Dewitt Clinton back to New York. Along the way, they were displayed in principal cities like Cleveland and Buffalo with the London and Northwestern Railway's Queen Empress. An interesting event almost transpired during this tour. A few railroads who had their locomotives on display at the fair wanted to hold a locomotive race betting with 999. The Queen Empress was to race 999 between Buffalo and New York, and Erie Railroad's 440, named E.B. Thomas, would race the winner. London and Northwestern's management ultimately put an end to those plans. After 999 returned to New York, it was put into regular service on the Syracuse Division, occasionally pulling the Empire State Express. Because of its larger drivers, 999 was severely limited to what it could pull due to its lower tractive effort. So, in June of 1899, it was converted into a regular Buchanan I-Class locomotive. Its 86-inch drivers were replaced with 70-inch ones and smaller pilot wheels. The boiler pressure was reduced to 180 pounds, both the front end of the boiler and cylinders were reduced in diameter, and the center line of the boiler was lowered. Among other changes, its boiler jacketing was repainted, and the Empire State Express script on its tender was replaced with abbreviated New York Central and Hudson River Railroad lettering. However, by the time these modifications were completed, 
new more powerful 442 Atlantic type locomotives were beginning to replace 440s. 999 was then put on the Rome, Watertown, and Ogdensburg division, pulling local passenger and milk trains on various branch lines. It was while on this division in May of 1906 that 999's original boiler was replaced with a new one built by the American Locomotive Company. When 999 was renumbered to 1086 in October 1913, the locomotive was practically unrecognizable after all these changes. It was last stationed on the Pennsylvania Division from 1916 until August 1920 when it was taken out of service and placed in a scrap deadline at Depew, New York. While waiting to be scrapped, a New York Central Railroad employee alerted one of the railroad's higher-ups about 1086's history. This unknown person's actions saved it from being scrapped, and in 1921 the locomotive was restored back to its 999 appearance by employees of the Central at their Avis, Pennsylvania shops. The New York Central was to use 999 exclusively for publicity purposes. It was displayed at many expositions all over the East Coast and Midwest like the 1938 Cleveland Exposition, the 1940 New York World Fair, and even ran under its own power at the 1948 and 1949 Chicago Railroad Fair. Here comes the famous 999, the fastest locomotive in the world, faster than anything else on wheels. After over four decades of exhibiting, the New York Central Railroad donated 999 to the Chicago Museum of Science and Industry on September 25, 1962. Ironically, the museum is located in the same place that the 1893 World's Columbian Exposition was held. 999 was originally displayed outdoors until the elements took their toll on the locomotive. In 1993, the museum, which at the time was undergoing major renovations, decided to house 999 in a permanent indoor exhibit. At the same time, the locomotive was cosmetically restored by steam specialist J. David Conrad. Still to this day, it looks as fresh as the day it rolled out of the New York Central's West Albany shops nearly 130 years ago. No matter if 999 never reached 112.5 miles per hour, it still was the fastest locomotive in the world at that point. I'm curious to know what you guys think, so leave me a comment below. On a dark stormy night, as the train rattled on, all the passengers had gone to bed.